And I present one of the sons of your usual label, Odaya Hawkins. Watch the room, everyone. This is part two of my sermonette on clean and unclean. Oh, you may be seated. I would like to focus on I would like to focus on the curses that come from breaking this law. If you'll all turn to Second Corinthians. 617 on page 904 2 Corinthians 617 and it says Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says Yahweh. Do not touch the unclean thing, and I will receive you. This scripture is telling us to come out from among them and not to touch the unclean thing. As we just read, the greatest curse of all is that we will not be accepted to Yahweh. If we continue to touch or eat the unclean thing. Do you remember what Pastor said about pork being on the same freezer shelf as all the other products, how it contaminates all the other products on the same shelf? In the 11th book of Israel, part 1, chapter 8, verse 21, and it says, You can't even go into a store and buy something clean. And I keep cautioning people on this. This stuff that you're buying in the store are unclean. You need to wear gloves. You need to spray the gloves. You need to spray yourself. You need to spray the stuff that you're buying. You need to try to wash the filthiness off of this stuff because it's touched and handled by unclean, filthy hands. Eating unclean food can cause sickness and diseases in the mind and body. From eating pork, there's a worm called trichna, and it causes disease called trichnosis, and it's deadly. Again, the purpose of my speech is to focus on the curses that come from breaking this law. In Yahweh, in the House of Yahweh booklet, Health Yahweh's Way, there's an article called Beast in the Belly, from page 14 to page 35, and it talks about the effects that come from eating pork. Now, I got a few recipes, unclean recipes. This one's about a possum. And it says you don't have, they don't encourage to kill opossums, but you could just find one that's got hit by a car. Raccoon. Raccoon dinner brings out Arkansas politicians. And down here, it says in order to be a successful Arkansas politician, you have to eat raccoon. You have to come to the raccoon dinner. (laughs) Armadillo. Uh, There's 15 patients that try to catch armadillo, and they got leprosy.
shellfish. Shellfish contains of oysters, clams, and mussels. The next one is rattlesnake. There, in Sweetwater, Texas, there is about 24,000 pounds of rattlesnake, and they milk all the venom out of them for charity. And they eat them. So in the end, after they do all this stuff, then they get diseases and some of them even die. So brothers and sisters, do not be pulled into this evil deception out in the world because they will try to tempt you with the unclean foods and with with all the unclean foods. So come to Yahweh's house and eat clean foods. And with that, if you all please stand. <laughs> Turn over to Sonny Israel about Bar's life for prayer. And now, if you all remain standing, I'd like to turn over to the great son of Yisrael Abel, Deacon Shalomo Hawkins. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. You may be seated. May the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you. You know, we may not be getting everything we want out of the day. Like, we may not be fitting things in that we may want to do. So today I'm going to be talking about use your time wisely, or using your time wisely. On page 63 of the acceptance, or the responsibility unit, it says, time management. The alarm clock goes off, but you're too tired to get up because you stayed up past your bedtime the night before. You hit the snooze button, but you never hear the alarm clock or the alarm come back on. Half an hour later, you wake up to the sound of your mother asking, why aren't you up yet? You literally bounce out of bed and jump in the shower. You barely get wet before you jump back out, throw on some clothes, and run outside just in time to catch the bus. You sit down with a sigh of relief, but soon your relief turns to major stress as you realize you forgot the report on your desk at home that was due today. And Miss Henry, your English teacher, informed the class that any late reports would automatically have 10 points taken off. Has anything like this ever occurred to you? Do you run out of time trying to accomplish everything you have to do? At the end of the day, you say to yourself, I should have put more time into studying for that test tomorrow instead of watching TV. The ability to effectively manage your duties, chores, activities, and leisure time is called time management. Time management plays a very important role in being responsible. And we're all trying to be responsible because that's a positive character trait that we all should strive to obtain, being responsible. All right, so then you realize that you shouldn't have done those things. You shouldn't have stayed up, but you should have studied, all right, for the test. Now, many people don't spend their time wisely out in the world. They, they want entertainment. If you turn to Exodus, Exodus 32, it's on page 72, verse 6, it says, So the next day, the people rose early, and offered burnt offerings, and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat, drink, and rose up to play. So you can see that they weren't spending their time wisely. So many people out in the world, they want entertainment, video games, mu music, 
cartoons, movies, and amusement parks. That's where that's some of the things that they want when they go out into the world. Now I have some consequences here, or the repercussions if you go this way. It says, uh, under the influence of music, it's from the New York Times. Now, this is from 2008. Keep that in mind while I'm reading the article. It says, teenagers who listen to an average of nearly 2.5 hours of music per day. Guess what they're hearing about? One in every, one in three popular songs contain explicit references to drug or alcohol, alcohol use. According to a report in the archives of pediatrics and adolescent medicine, that means kids are receiving about 35 references to substance abuse for every hour of music they listen to, the authors determine. So that's at least, or that's one every two minutes that they're getting a negative influence in their head. And then they're listening to two hours, so that's 70 negative influences they're getting. Now it says, nearly nine out of ten adolescents and teens have an MP3 player or a compact disc player in their bedrooms. Well, now it's MP4s, because you could watch movies on those. Then you also have uh, tablets, iPads, all these things that now they now have now that technology increased. It says, studies have long shown that media messages have a pronounced impact on childhood risk behavior, like committing suicide. That's what the uh, scientists have shown, that it, that it could cause these behaviors, like committing suicide, hurting yourself. It says only 9% of pop songs had lyrics re relating to drug or alcohol. The number jumped to 14% for rock songs, 20% for R&B and hip hop songs, 36% for country songs, and 77% for rap songs. So even though it's higher in like rap songs, but lower, even though it's lower in other music like pop, they still have negative influences in them. Next, movies. All right, that's another thing that they want out in the world, these movies. It says, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation, two-thirds of infants and toddlers watch a screen average of two hours a day. Kids under six watch an average of about two hours of screen media a day primarily TV and videos or DVDs. Kids and teens, 8 to 18, spend nearly four hours a day in front of TV screen and almost two additional hours on the computer. So that's six hours a day that they're just sitting there in front of a TV. It says the first two years of life are considered a critical time for brain development. TV and other electronic media can get in the way of exploring, playing, and interacting with parents and others, which encourages learning and healthy physical social development. So when they're, when they're watching TV or watching a movie or something like this, they're not getting those things they need out of life. They're not discussing things with their parents and learning. Video games. That's the next one. It says the dangers of playing video games. All right, one of the things is muscle pain. Excessive television game playing led to high, or led to increased levels of muscle stiffness, especially in the shoulders. Seizures. There is no scientific evidence that video games can cause epilepsy, but stress, fatigue, and hyperventilation during video games can trigger seizures in children with epilepsy. Obesity. Measured on the body mass index scale, it's estimated that roughly one-third of Americans are obese, and this is largely blamed on bad diets and secondary lifestyles. In children ages 1 to 12, results indicated that while television use 
was not related to children weight status, video game use was. And then aggressive behavior. Experts have long debated whether violent video games desensitize young people to violence. But the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program, it shows you in there that it, if you watch a lot of violence, then you'll become desensitized to it. And it says, which is dangerous to the community at large. And then also poor grades in school. And then from the uh, 10th book of Israel, 10th book of Israel, chapter 8, part 2, and it's verse 9. This is talking about uh, amusement parks. It says, and if that's not exciting enough, they got this spongy cord that you can go way up on top of tower, and they hook this thing on your legs, and you jump off, and it's supposed to stop you before your head hits the concrete. They have forgotten to tie it, you know, and people have lost their lives. They've lost their lives trying to find that excitement. They thought it was going to bring joy to their life. So they think that it's going to bring joy, but it actually brings curses, all right? If you forget to do these things, and then you also have on a, a roller coaster, people have been stranded for hours because a bolt came off. Or, so you can see how these things bring curses. So how you could manage your time or use your time wisely. I have a few steps here. The first one is know your needs versus your wants. It's on page 67 of the responsibility unit. It says, understanding the difference between what you want to do and what you need to do takes careful thought and being honest with yourself. You have to stop, think, and then make the right choice to be responsible. In other words, it takes self-control. There, there will always be fun activities to pull you away from the things you need to do. This is why you must be willing to practice self-control because having fun should never come before fulfilling your obligations to yourself and others. So you have to decide what your needs and wants are. And then the second step is prioritize. Prioritize is to decide what is most important and do those things first. It's on page 68 of the responsibility unit. It says once you distinguish between your needs and wants, the next step is to rank the things you need to do based on the order of importance. This is called prioritizing. All right, like you would shower and brush your teeth. Once you wake up, you shower and brush your teeth. Then you get dressed, eat breakfast, and go to school. All right, that's how you would prioritize. The next step is make a schedule. It's on page 69. However, you will find that as you get older, you will have many different duties and obligations that will not always occur at the same time. Without taking the time to organize and write down your duties for the day, you may forget to do something important or, or arrive late for a function. Making a daily to-do list, preferably the night before, will help you organize and schedule your activities. Making up a schedule and organizing takes, your time takes planning. So take some time daily to sit down and consider what you need to do or what you need to accomplish for that day and do not procrastinate. In other words, do not put it off for tomorrow what needs to be done, like that age-old saying. All right, and you can see that a lot of people, they'll be like, well, I'll do it tomorrow. And then tomorrow comes, and oh, I'll do that tomorrow. All right, they keep saying tomorrow. So don't procrastinate. It says write it down in a notebook that you have set aside for that purpose. As you accomplish each task, then check it off. All right, so make a schedule. A schedule will help you fit everything into your day. Now, if your schedule is packed and there's no need to accomplish it, or there's there's no way you can accomplish everything in that schedule, then you have to prioritize, all right, and figure out your needs versus your wants. 
And make sure you schedule in time for studying. Remember, setting your mind in advance for that day. If you turn to 2 Tamaya, it's on page 938. 2 Tamaya 2.15, it says, Study to show yourself approved to Yahweh, a workman who is who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, the law and the prophets. And so study to show yourself approved. All right, that's one day that we could, or that's one way that we could deal with these things that come up during the day. All right, by setting your mind in advance. And then you have to be organized. It's to arrange or form into a coherent unity or functioning whole. The more organized you are, the less time that you're going to waste. And then focus on the task at hand. All right. So go through each one of those steps, and you'll find that your day will be a lot easier, and you'll be using your time wisely. And with that, if everyone will please stand. I'd like to turn it over to the great Khan Michael. Our speaker, the great Khan Shaul Hawkins. Shabbat Shalom! Praise Yahweh, brothers and sisters, you may be seated. I want to start this morning here in Revelation 22 and verse 12. Here, this is something we're, this is real soon to come to pass here. As Yahshua said, Behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work will be. Now, we're going to get a reward from Yahshua depending on our work. We're either going to hear, well done, faithful servant, enter into the kingdom of my father. Or we're going to hear Yahshua say, get away from me, I never knew you. And what determines this brothers and sisters, is our own actions, our own decisions. You know, we are here trying to become in complete unity with Yahweh as one body, but we do stand as individuals in front of Yahweh. We can't say, well, Yahweh, you should let me into the kingdom because I, I saw, I knew, I knew Israel, I know Israel. I saw him speak once, or I think I listened to him one time. Oh, yeah, yeah, you know him? Okay, you're in. No, we're not getting in on pastor's coattails. We're getting in on our own actions and our own decisions. And we're going to hit on this today, because if you have been paying attention, even to the last two or three weeks of pastor's sermons and the news here this kingdom is soon to be here. All right? This nuclear war is at the door. Now, I know on the news, they're, I think they're a little bit schizophrenic. One day, it sounds like they're about ready to go to war. The next day, you turn the news on, and everything's glorious. Everything's joyous. There's not even any mention about a war. You know, but trust me, that's what the news wants to put in our mind. But the fact is that these nations are chomping at the bit right now, like that Gerald Salente said on the interview with RT, the trend, the guy that watches the trends, the whole trend is how are the nations going to go to war? No one is talking peace. They used to talk peace. No one is talking peace. This is coming. And I beg you, brothers and sisters, today, please pay attention to every word that we bring here today, every scripture, because Yahweh is weeding out who is going to be in his kingdom and who is not. And just sitting here in this room is not enough to cut it. We've got to remove every spot, every wrinkle, every blemish. Because Yahshua is coming quickly. And he says, hold fast to what you have. He means continue to practice what I've taught you. And yes, Yahshua is teaching us. Yahweh taught Yahshua. Yahshua is inspiring pastor. 
and you can count on every word that that man brings us is straight from Yahweh, straight from Yahshua. If you have any doubt about that at all, brothers and sisters, you're in the wrong place. There's a Vatican down the road that would welcome you with open arms and whatever your heart desires, whatever you dream up on your own, they'll be more than glad to let you do it. But turn over to uh, 2 Timothy, if you would. 2 Timothy. And Shaul's writing here, he says, Know this also, that in the last days, and there should be no question that we are in the last of the last days, right here. Perilous times will come. Yes, perilous, dangerous. There's a lot of danger, and that's what Pastor was was warning us about, the danger that's out in this world from the wars, the sicknesses, diseases, and so forth, you know, that the world is going to be enduring and going through, that Yahweh is trying to save us from, but also the danger to our eternal life that we're facing right now. Because this isn't a game. This isn't a game that Yahweh's playing with us. Notice what he tells us here, and, and he, he, these, this should not be, as he said in another place, among the called out ones. But I'm afraid to, it is. For men and women here, this isn't just for the men. <laughs> you know, like another part we're going to read is not just for the women. If you notice down here, uh, he said uh, in verse 6, these are the sort that creep into the house of Yahweh and lead away silly women. You know, so they're only leading away the women, the men. They did what they did the same thing, but they weren't led away, right? No, he's talking to everyone here. Will be lovers of themselves. Think about this now. Lovers of themselves. Covetous, boasters, proud, proud, lifting yourself up, bragging on your abilities. <laughs> you know, brethren, we have nothing, nothing, no ability, no skill, no nothing without Yahweh and what we've learned. If we, you were, you know, if you could have bragged, you should have bragged when you were an infant and shown what you could have done then. You know, <laughs> no, you had to grow, you had to learn, someone had to teach you. You know, so don't brag on yourself. Blasphemers, notice here, disobedient to parents, parents and teachers, the spiritual father and mother as well, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers. I mean, these are, these, each of these could be a series of sermons here, but uh, notice, without self-control, brutal, despisers of those who are righteous, uh, jump down here, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of Yahweh. Lovers of pleasure. Having a form of holiness. Well, I came to the Sabbath once, or I came to the feast once. Well, what'd they talk about? Well, I don't know. Uh, you'll have to get the tape. <laughs> you know, a form of holiness, but denying the authority of it from such turn away. Now, he's not just talking about people. He's talking about ideas, practices that we have in our life that we need to turn away from that actually fall into these categories here. You know, it may not even be our intention, you know, that we're like this, but we're just, you know, we let these things slip that pastors brought to us over the years. You know, anything that interferes with us being made presentable, yes, pastors trying to make us presentable to Yahshua and Yahweh. Anything, that, uh, whatever that keeps us from being in the image and likeness of Yahweh. Remember Genesis 1.26. That's the reason you were born. And the world doesn't know why they were born. They have no idea why they were born. Why am I here? Why am I here? You see, that's a big question in the world. Well, I've got to find my purpose. You know, so I'm going to go out there and do this. I'm going to do whatever my heart and emotions lead me to because I've got to be myself. I've got to find my purpose. 
Well, we know what the purpose mankind was created for, don't we? To be in Yahweh's image and likeness. But he's not dealing with everybody all at once. He's dealing in certain stages. And right now it's our stage, ours, not the rest of the world, just us are the only ones, even given the opportunity, even given the understanding, as Yachanan said, for we were given an understanding to realize this. And this was itself, this knowledge here is a gift from Yahweh. To be in Yahweh's image and likeness. This is the only reason we're here. We're not here to have fun. We're not here to please ourselves. We're not here to seek pleasure, you know, at the expense of, of Yahweh here. That's not what he, to have a great time, although you can have a great time. I'm going to show you how. You can enjoy. Uh, you know, pastor's been telling us rejoice always. Rejoice through our many tribulations. Does that mean they're going to be, you know, fun like the great deacon brought out here? No, but we rejoice knowing what comes after. We rejoice in knowledge, not in emotions and all these experiences that the world tells you to seek after. But we can have great experiences, the best experiences actually, that bring no harm to ourselves and others if we will be of the right mindset. Remember, have this mind be in you that was in Yahshua. If we'll develop that, who is in the image and likeness of Yahweh, we will find true joy in what the world rejects. And we'll really, this is the real satisfaction. The world seeks after satisfaction that is temporary. It's not lasting. It's empty. It's hollow. Just like Christmas. The tree that dies. It's dead when you bring it into your house. Because you cut it down. You cut it off at the roots. There's no more life can go in it. Oh, but we'll decorate it and make it look alive. Oh, how pretty. This is a lifestyle. It's not just about trees. We're going to get rid of all the pine trees in the kingdom. You know, no, this is a lifestyle. A way of life that he's talking about here. That's true life, true joy, lasting joy, not temporary. But he says, let us consider one another how we may urge one another on toward love, love and righteous works. Well, the first thing is the world has no idea what love is. <laughs> All right. Love to them is what we just read in Timothy there, the temporary pleasure stuck on themselves, you know, only thinking about themselves and how they can get an advantage and what would please themselves. That's love in the world. And righteous works. Well, forget about that word righteous. They don't use it. They don't want to know what it is. They've rejected it completely. There is nothing righteous. A little leaven leavens the whole batch, remember? So it's total unrighteousness. The mixture of righteousness and evil, it turns out, is not righteous. Remember? <laughs> so they don't now have any idea. And then he tells us, not forsaking the gathering of ourselves together. The proper gathering of ourselves. And we're going to learn today that there is a righteous, holy gathering and there are unrighteous, unholy gatherings. All right? Some, the manner of some is. They'll, they'll skip out on the righteous, holy gatherings and, and, and instead and go to the unrighteous gatherings instead. And not forsaking these, but exhorting one another. And so much more as you see the day approaching. As you see the day approaching. Do we see the day approaching? Can you see it? Remember in Hebrews 11, they said, he said, they see this kingdom afar off. Well, in terms of miles, it may still be far off. We can't really see it with the naked eye, but we can see all these things that would precede it that Yahshua told us about, every last one of them, we see it right now. We see it every week on the news here. 
Anytime you look at any of the news, you see those things and you know that is, that's not the, the sum total of the future of mankind forever and ever. It's going to be this wasteland here that we're looking out at in the world. No, this is going to end. And there's something coming after it. And that's what we rejoice in. We rejoice in a coming kingdom. Not like we're saying, well, yay, look at that nuclear bomb that went off. You know, or, oh, somebody died, all right. You know, we're not celebrating that. We're celebrating what comes after, which is a kingdom that's going to put a stop to this. But if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice. If we give up, if we quit the house of Yahweh, there's no hope for us left. But if, as long as we're here and striving to do diligently everything we're commanded to do, we are on the right path. We've got to do it, though. Knowledge that's not put into action is useless. <laughs> you're better off if you're not going to put it into action Forget about it. Go on. Maybe you weren't even called out. If you're not going to put the knowledge into action. And that doesn't mean your neighbor put it to action in his life. Or, you know, it ta take it to yourself, as it says in 1 Timothy there. For the law is perfect if one takes it to himself, using it to himself, changing your own behavior. This is what we need. As Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of Yahweh, that you present your bodies. Remember, we're trying to be made presentable here. We can't do it on our own, but we can do it if we follow the instruction that we're given. As living sacrifices, holy, acceptable to Yahweh, removing all the spot and blemishes, which is your reasonable service. And notice verse 2, and do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. The pattern of this world. This is what we got to get out of us. This is what pastors have been striving for 80 years to get out of us. Yes, 80 years, because it's, he started on this path to being able to do this and teach us when he was just a wee baby. Getting this pattern out, it's like the old saying, you can take the boy out of Egypt, but you can't take Egypt out of the boy. All right? And he's been trying to get Egypt out of us, Christianity, out of us ever since we came into the door. But we want to hang on to these things. We hold them dear. They're like a dear friend or something that we can't let go. And Yahweh's telling us, let go of that thing because it's going to keep you out of my kingdom. <clears throat> this pattern. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may, may be able to test and prove what is the righteous and acceptable and perfect will of Yahweh. It doesn't mean that you're going to become the ultimate judge over what's right and wrong is that you will have the knowledge in your mind put there by Israel Hawkins and you'll be able to take any activity or any thought or anything that's set before you and you'll be able to say, well, that doesn't match up with what pastor taught me. I'm going to get away from that. That don't match up with what he told us to do. Matter of fact, that goes against it and I'm going to get away from it. All right, so this world has a lot of these patterns that we was raised up in, and today we're going to try to purge out some of this old leaven here. And it is old leaven, and we're going to see how old it is here uh, through the course of this sermon today. But the subject is, and Pastor, years ago, matter of fact, I've got, I only did a little bit, and I got ten pages here, because it turns out Pastor's the one that brought the sermon on this subject, uh, little bit by little bit here, uh, about the visitation, about the visiting. And I think we weren't really applying it to our own situation. We were looking for that loophole, because he used, sometimes he used the word party, 
parties, and we'll define that here soon. But in the sixth book of Israel, sixth book of Israel, chapter 9, in verse 77, and by the way, I got this from Israel says, it's like the songs that were written about the hippie who was wasting time. All right, think of the previous sermon as well. I guess somebody had scolded him for just sitting around, and he said, don't tell me there's nothing to do. I'm counting flowers on the wall and playing solitaire at home. He said, did you gain a lot of knowledge that way? He says, that's about the same mentality. Think about that. Think about what we read about this guy staring at the wall and playing solitaire. That's the same mentality as when you go visiting. You sit and gossip and waste time. Visitation is the biggest time waster there is. It was put forth by Hollywood for entertainment and to push fornication and adultery. Those are the things the parties were pushed forward to. And I know some of us maybe in our mind we think, well, you know, a party, that's, uh, you know, I didn't get an invitation in the mail and get all dressed up and drive in a limousine. We just got together at so-and-so's house. Well, we're not really uh, examining what a party is here. Let me read you some definitions. A party, a social gathering at a private home. You see what he's saying right there? A home is a private place. It's not open to anybody else. And we're going to show this deeper in the scriptures here. Shouldn't be open to anybody else but the one who lives there or ones who live there. But a social gathering at a private home for conversation. Oh, we were just sitting around talking. We weren't having a party. <laughs> Refreshments, eating and drinking. And I remember some of these parties, there was a lot more drinking than eating that ever went on. I think it was called liquid bread back in the day, if you know what I mean. Entertainment. Oh, you get a guy with a guitar and uh, fornication or adultery wasn't too far behind. And I'm talking about this went on in the house of Yahweh years ago that we had to deal with and try to get people off of this stuff, a social gathering. And I want you to keep the scriptures. We also read about men being lovers, you know, people being lovers of themselves, wanting to please themselves, lovers of pleasure, a social gathering for pleasure, a social event in which entertainment, food, and drinks are provided uh, to enjoy oneself. Uh, typically eating, drinking, and music. A gathering for social pleasure. So are we clear on what a party is? Do there have to be decorations and limousines and <laughs> paparazzi? You know, do, you don't have to go to the Oscars to have a party, right? So this is what pastor's talking about. And that was years ago, brethren, to stop that we needed to stop these gatherings here. Now, turn over to Proverbs 25, because he wasn't giving his own opinion here. <laughs> Pastor showing us how to be like Yahweh, how to be like Yahshua, how to be like Nora, a servant, a slave. But, you know, a lot of the times, I think the Scriptures... You know, and this is the way they were translated, and pastors bringing the pure word back. And then we read these, and, and especially if we read them before the house of Yahweh, we thought we understood what it was saying. We already had our mind made up. Well, this is what it's talking about. This is okay. It's not till we start breaking it down here that, we, that it actually starts uh, sinking in. Here, and this is, I'll tell you, 10 pages about partying, and we're still partying. <laughs> you know, you may not have called it that, though. Okay, but the pastor was trying to get through to us here. 
Now in, in uh, Proverbs 25, verse 17, this is not at all translated correctly because it gives you a false impression. Be an infrequent visitor in your brother's house or he will become tired of you and begin uh, to dislike you. Infrequent. Well, how frequent is infrequent? Well, I only go there a couple times a day. I only go there before and after work, or, you know, once a week, once a month. You know, he didn't define what infrequent was there, did he? Well, come to find out, that's not what the original says. The King James has it a little bit closer here. In Proverbs 25, 17, it says, Withdraw thy foot from thy neighbor's house. Withdraw thy foot from thy neighbor's house. Does that sound a little clearer? We're going to get deeper into it. Lest he be weary of thee and so hate thee. Withdraw. Let's look at that word withdraw. It's word... Uh, Number 3365, it means to inhibit, to withdraw, to remove, remove from a place. So remove your foot from your, from your neighbor's house, to turn away from an object of attention. And you'll see how well, about more of these objects of attention here as we go on. To move back or away. Move back or away, to draw back from, to remove oneself from participation. Back away, drop back, fall back, pull out, retreat, flee, recoil, bow out, disengage, pull away, abandon, depart, evacuate, <laughs> go Leave, quit, and vacate. There's not really a whole lot of ambig ambiguity in that word, is there? But, you know, as we were, you know, having to go through these things, you know, it got in there, be an infrequent visitor. But now we can see how infrequently <laughs> we are to actually be a visitor, right? Pretty clear there on this inhibit. This withdraw, withdrawing your foot. Okay? Withdraw your foot. Now, it sounds like here this lest, well, you know, he might, you know, withdraw your foot or be an infrequent visitor because he might get tired of you. Uh, that This word lest here means, uh, it's word uh, 6435, means beware lest, L-E-S-T, says, uh, uh, now this is from uh, Gesenius, uh, removing, taking away, it becomes a conjunction of removing, prohibiting, hindering. It is used where an action precedes, like withdrawing, by which something is prohibited, which we fear and desire removed. You wouldn't want someone, and we'll look at the word weary and hate here, you definitely don't want that weary and hate to develop there, but it will. Look over, Turn over to uh, uh, Genesis 3, and we're going to see the same word here, uh, it's used in the King James, which this conversation could have very well been going on here uh, at a family gathering, you know, where people are comfortable and they're conversing and they're just, you know, talking their mind, speaking their mind here. Uh, and uh, uh, in, in verse 1, as Yahweh indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden and the woman said to the serpent no she wasn't visiting with a snake okay we may eat of the trees of the fruit of the uh, the fruit of the trees of the garden 
But notice verse 3, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, Yahweh has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, uh, lest ye die, is how that phrase is in the King James. Was he saying if you did it, you maybe uh, you might die? There's an outside chance. I mean, there's a 1% probability you might die. No, this was a certainty there. It was a certainty. It was a guarantee. If you do this, you will die. If you do this thing, and it ties right in here because this is the fruit of the tree of righteousness and evil this visiting is. It's the fruit of this evil tree, the visiting. So not only are you going to cause this weariness and hate, it's also going to cause your death. If we continue this, brothers and sisters, we got to get it out of us. It's not a maybe. It's a definite. It's a prohibition. Okay, lest ye die. He wasn't telling him, well, you might die. You know, who knows? You know, do what you want. Let's see what occurs. You know, let's play it by ear. You know, this was a definite. Now, this word weary here, and remember, we're not trying to please ourselves. We're trying to please Yahweh. I want to show you where this word weary, turn over to Isaiah 1. Isaiah 1, and he's speaking to the people that he brought out of Egypt, but Moshe and, and the righteous prophets were trying to get the Egypt out of the people still. And they wouldn't let it go. Remember in Samuel's day, let us have a king like the Egyptians did. Man, we had it made down there. Remember how great it was and how much fun we had and, and how much money we could make? You know, let us have that. And Yahweh is, is speaking to that nation. In verse 4, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children who are corruptors. Well, that sounds like some other group out there, right? Well, that was us. That was us before pastor got a hold of us and started trying to teach us. Or Yahweh got a hold of us, brought us here, and we started to be taught. This is what we came in as. Okay? But notice what he says in verse 14. Because he's talking about the gather. Well, let's look at verse 13. Because it makes it sound like, well, you know, you had to build a church, or you had to build this building, and it had to be a formal uh, set thing, which they do have. But it goes beyond that. In verse 13... Uh, do not bring any more vain oblations. Your incense is abominable to me. May not be incense at all. Maybe some cheap perfume you put on before you went to the party. Or <laughs> whatever. You, the new moons and Sabbaths. Your calling of assemblies I cannot endure. Even the solemn meeting is iniquity. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. They're the exact opposite of what Yahweh wants to see, and they bring forth the, behavior, the exact opposite of the behavior that Yahweh wants to see in his people. They are a, a trouble to me. I am weary of, hear, of bearing them. It's not your neighbor that gets weary of you. It's Yahweh. Do you want Yahweh to be wearied by our foolish behavior? Is this what we want? Now this hatred, you know, the, and we're going to read these examples, and, you know, they first off didn't, didn't seem, you know, really like, like hatred. You know, they... they they been they were desirable, just like in Genesis three. Turn back there, because I want you to see these things. And please, brothers and sisters, this is our very lives 
that are depending on these things and are grasping them and are getting them out of our life and not participating in it at all, okay? These aren't idle words that Yahweh is bringing to us here through pastor. You know, we look out into the world today, and even now you can drive to Abilene, everything looks normal, the roads are there, the buildings, the stores. Yeah, the people may have diseases, but they just go to the hospital, and it doesn't seem to bother us. You know, you don't get bothered by it. But very soon, this whole infrastructure that we have, is what they call it, is going to be demolished. Utterly and completely demolished. And the things that that we take for granted as being solid, they're going to be vaporized. Okay? The things we think, you know, since we were raised with them, you know, some people never, they don't know what life was like without a cell phone. You know, there used to be a cord. It used to be stuck on a wall, the phone did. And there was a cord, a cord and you could only walk so far with that cord. And you're, you actually went like this with your hand to make a phone call. Some people, and, and then before that even, with no phones, they used to call it, and this is why visiting, they used to call it calling upon people. They come a-calling. Okay? This is what it was known as. And then, of course, with the telephone, but, you know, and you can call somebody. If you really need to talk to them, you can call them, right? Most most people, if you really have to say something, you know, that bad to them. Uh, But here it says uh, in verse 6, So the woman saw that the tree was desirable. Yes, these these parties, these gatherings, these visits, they're pleasant for sometimes. If you notice the news at Christmas time, they soon get violent unless you're armed and ready to do battle with your family. You know, they're not so pleasant. And so you have to go in there with body armor on in order to enjoy that morsel of poison food that they're going to try to serve you that pork sausage or whatever, you know. (laughs) So people think they're pleasant, though, and they look forward to them, and they stock up. You can see the aisles, you know, and now they're gearing up for these these, uh, Super Bowl parties and all this with all the food and the drink, and they're such a great time, and the people go home if they make it home, you know, and they don't end up in the hospital. They think it's a joyous time. But it's actually hatred, all right? And these following the pattern of this world, although it may feel enjoyable to you for a moment, you're actually teaching and displaying and developing in your body and in your mind a hatred for Yahweh. Yeah, because Yahweh is the one that we're dealing with here, all right? The neighbor may say, oh, it doesn't bother me. Come on over. Move in. You know, (laughs) take over. I'm going out of town. You have the place, you know, and we're going to see an example. But during these things, you know, this is when sin begins to build, especially if there's this mixed company here. Turn over to Genesis 18. Now remember the, the, the heathen world, the pagan world, the, pe- the people that rejected Yahweh, they had no trouble doing these things, having these gatherings. It wasn't a bother. They didn't, they didn't have a problem with it. They had problems because of it. Big problems. Huge problems in their life. But it, they didn't think anything of it. And they agreed... To participate in it. it. They thought it was pleasant, just like the tree was desirable here. In Genesis 18, And then Yahweh appeared to Abraham near the trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. So Abraham looked up 
and saw three men standing nearby. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed low to the ground. And he said, If I have found honor in your eyes, my rulers, do not pass your servant by. Okay, these, these men of Yahweh, these were priests, these were counselors that were coming and they had to travel. They didn't have, you know, close uh, uh, travel like we have today. Here, we think of the, the land of Yahweh, just it's rather small, the 44 acres, and you don't have to go very far. Well, these men could have walked very far to get to Abraham. So he was going to bring him a morsel here and so on. So Abraham hastened the tent to Sarah. Then he brought them the, the meal. Because, and this is different than just going, this has nothing to do with inviting people over, let's come over and hang out. All right? These men, these three men, they had a job to do. And they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, here in the tent. But Sarah, notice, didn't come out of the tent. She didn't appear before these men. She stayed in her own tent. All right? She stayed in her own dwelling. And the men, uh, I will certainly return uh, to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah could hear, these are tents, not brick walls here. These are tents. And she could hear what the counselors were telling, but she never came out and showed her face. Okay? Think about this. This was the holy men and women of old that we're told to look up to. Look to Abraham, your father, he says, and, and to the rock from which you were dug. And to the women, he says, look to Abraham, or look to Sarah, rather, your mother, and be like she was. This is, these are commands given to us in the scriptures. But Sarah didn't come out and join in the fun or the party, even if you want to look at it like that. Because it wasn't a party. These counselors were coming to inform Abraham that because of his righteousness, and if you remember from Genesis 26, 5, that Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my laws, that they knew the plan and the prophecy that from Abraham would come the Messiah, a perfect man who would never sin. And so this, and it wasn't because, well, they, uh, Yahweh just picked a name out of a hat. They were being made by Melchizedek into the image and likeness of Yahweh. They didn't break this, even though what we just read wasn't, you know, written in that form until Proverbs much later. This is the law of ownership, the law of possession. And they didn't break that. And so these men left and, and they, but Sarah never showed herself to these men. But others that came after didn't stay so true to these instructions. Let's look at one example that didn't turn out so great here in Genesis 34. Now Dina, in verse 1, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne, to Jacob went out to see and means visit the daughters of the land. Well, she didn't mean to go out and meet any boys. She was going to see the women, supposedly. But you know, the priest had actually told her not to do this. Don't go out here. Don't go out and get involved in this. But I'm sure her mother or her grandmother was telling her, Oh, that's not a law. There's no harm in that. What's the harm in that? 
There's no sin. There's no sin. You need to go out and see these things. You need to go out and experience this. You need to, you're just going to talk to the girls after all. You can go ahead and do this. You don't have to listen to that priest. Brothers and sisters, when we reject the word of the priest in these last days, we reject Yahshua and Yahweh, and we reject life itself. And we become the one that Yahshua is going to say very soon now, get away from me, I never knew you. But the priest had said, don't go. Well, look what occurred. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, the ruler of that area, saw her, he saw her. All right? He saw her. Could have been in a mixed company party. Well, come on over, you know, meet my family. You know, she met some of these daughters and then they said, well, come over to our house and, and let's have a gathering. Oh, well, no, let's go to the, no, let's, we don't go to the house of Yahweh. Let's go over here. Well, wait till you meet my brother. Notice what occurred with her. Read the rest of verse 2. Then look at verse 3. Oh, he loved her. He spoke tenderly to her. Oh, his heart was just filled with love. Right? Urge one another on towards love and righteous works. Do <laughs> you think that's what was occurring? And because of this, because of not listening to the priests, because of giving in to visitation and parties, thousands died. And this was even spoken of in Genesis 49. Do you remember? Let's look at Genesis 49 right quick. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are weapons of violence. Let me not enter their counsel. And it all arose... Through visiting. Can you see the evil that visiting brings yet? Well, we got a ways to go here. <laughs> Turn over to Genesis 39. You may think, well, this is part of my job. I got, I, we, work, we work together. This is my job. Well, let's, talk, let's see about what occurred with a guy who had a job here out in the world. Egypt. Now, Yosef had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. Yahweh was with Yosef, and he was a successful man, and he lived in the house of his owner, the Egyptian. Notice, remember, he had been sold into slavery. He was owned. Do you realize we are owned as well? Not by Potiphar the Egyptian. Turn, back, turn over to 1 Corinthians. Please, I hope you're writing these things down, brothers and sisters, so that you, from the Scriptures, can remind yourself in the privacy of your own private home, of the things that will make you like Yahweh and gain an entrance to the kingdom or the things that's going to cause Yahshua to say, get away from me. It's our choice. He says, do you not know uh, that your body is the sanctuary of spirit holy in you? which you have from Yahweh. This is the teachings that we have had, if we'll let them in. That's 1 Corinthians six nineteen. Sorry about that. And you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify Yahweh in your body and in your spirit, that's your mind, your being, 
your strength, that's led by the teachings, your decisions, your attitude. Glorify Yahweh with your attitude. Because you can say, okay, with your mouth, but your attitude can stink. Your attitude can be opposed. Well, here he's telling you, glorify Yahweh with your attitude. Which, you know, like it or not, we do have control over our attitude, as we learn in the Peaceful Solution. Which are Yahweh's. Now, Yosef here, he didn't really have a choice. He was a captive. He didn't have a choice, so he was, had to live in this house, the Egyptian. When his owner saw that Yahweh was with him and Yahweh gave him success in everything he did, that Yosef found honor in his eyes uh, and became his attendant. Potiphar made him overseer of his house and put into his hand everything he had. In other words, he basically gave him permission to do anything he wanted to do. And I've heard this before. Well, I had to go. The guy gave me permission to go over there. The guy gave me permission to go to his house and wait there till he got there. Even though his wife was there in the room, he gave me permission. <laughs> if someone gives you permission, how can they give you permission to commit sin and that really be permission? You may go ahead and commit sin. Hell, the world gives you permission. They, pork is legal. You know? <laughs> Well, they talk about putting le things on the market. Are they going to, what if they legalize this? Well, pork is legal. You got permission. Go ahead and eat it. You know, you can buy it without a prescription. Of course, you may need a prescription <laughs> before too long. But he had permission to be there. But he really had no choice. Uh, he entrusted, let's jump down to verse 6. All that he had into Yosef's hand, and he did not concern himself with anything. Notice anything, except for the bread which he ate, and Yosef was handsome in form and appearance. So Yosef is out and about, in and around Potiphar's house. Okay, mingling, had to mingle with everybody else that was there. Was it a party? Well, maybe so. <laughs> Sounds like a party. The guy was a live-in house guest. But the point is, they were there. There was social interaction going on. Men and women together. And as we're warned, notice verse 7. After a while, his owner's wife cast longing eyes upon Yosef. And she said to him, do this thing. But he refused. Yosef refused. You know, if he hadn't refused, Potiphar probably wouldn't have cared less. That's how they were trained and raised. Remember, when he said he turned everything, he did not concern himself with anything. He gave it all to Yosef. He didn't care. All right? This is the no-care attitude of the world. But he refused and said to the owner's wife, My owner does not concern himself with what I do in his house, and he has committed all that he has to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept anything back except you, because you are his wife. How then could I commit such great wickedness? I mean, but these Egyptians, they live that lifestyle. Okay, he wouldn't have cared. He would have been hush, hush, okay? But notice Yosef ran. He says, how then could I commit such great wickedness and sin against Yahweh? And though she spoke to Yosef day after day, he refused to sin. He refused to sin. Read, I'm just saying sin. Read the rest of that verse. He wouldn't go in the room with her. He wouldn't stand to be in the same room. He followed the same type of pattern or tried to in his difficult circumstances. 
as Sarah had. She didn't go out there where the men were. Uh, but it came, in verse 10, But it came to pass about this time when Yosef went into the house to do his work, he had to do his work, and none of the men of the house were inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, "Let you know, commit sin. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. All right, he performed Proverbs 25, 17. He evacuated. All right, he ran out of there. We need to run from these situations in our own lives. And even we don't even need to get involved. If someone tries to entice us or invite us, we need to run from them. We need to run, just like Yosef did. You know, this is the law of ownership, and this is where the parties started here in Egypt. Pastor will tell us later how they started from Hollywood in these last days, but Hollywood got it from the Vatican, which the popes, which started in Egypt. This is where the mixed company gatherings, you didn't see Abraham and Sarah doing that thing, did you? And you didn't see the men that came to visit Abraham wasting time. They came to deliver a message, a prophecy to this man, a sermon to let him know, look, you've been chosen by Yahweh for a job. Now let's have a party. <laughs> All right, no. <laughs> Where's your wife? <laughs> you know, <laughs> come on. <laughs> this wasn't anything like this. I'm trying to make it ridiculous to you so it'll stick in your mind the next time you're invited to participate in any kind of foolishness like this. All right, now let's look at the Apostle Shaul here, what some of the things that uh, he had to say about these things. Yeah, let's turn to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 5. Well, let's start with verse 5 here. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 5. Now, she is indeed a widow who is left alone, who trusts in Yahweh and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who lives for pleasure, and this is not just, like I said, the widows he's picking on, you know, you widows, you can't live for pleasure. Everybody else, have at it. <laughs> the one who lives for pleasure is dead even while they live. Now give these things as commands so that they may be blameless. Shaul had the same job here with the, the people here that Pastor has for us. He's trying to make us blameless before Yahweh. Remember it was said of Yahshua, who is holy, blameless, harmless. He brought no harm to himself or others although he was greatly harmed in his body for doing so. But he brought no harm to others, not by his words and not by his example. Now, uh, about the widows, they should be, and this is everyone, in, uh, well known for righteous works. If she has brought up children and the bringing up of children takes place on the men's side as well. The training and teaching of certain children after a certain age, not the girls, but the boys. These are like qualifications here that he's given. Don't just think widow. Oh, that's all, you know, they can get. Shown hospitality to strangers. Strangers, newcomers to Yahweh's house. Has washed the saints' feet. Yes, we have stations here where there's washing of feet done 
at every door. Do we not? This is part of the humble servitude. And has relieved the afflicted, you know, carried the load for others, and diligently followed every righteous work. Keep in mind now, go back to the beginning when we were there in uh, Timothy, first Tim, or Second Timothy, and then in Hebrews about love and righteous works. But refuse the younger. Now this is talking about putting them on a list to be taken care of. Uh, for when their sensual desires make them want to marry, they turn away from the Messiah. When they don't want to do their job and they want to seek pleasure, as we saw there in verse 6, they turn away from Messiah and so become guilty of breaking their first faith to Him. And they also learn to waste their time in going around from house to house. Now, does it, did they go to other widows' houses? Now, if I'm a single guy, I can go to all the single guys' houses, right? This doesn't apply to me, right? Or am I right? No. <laughs> Praise Yahweh. Just seeing if you're still paying attention here. And waste their time in going around from house to house. But even worse, they learn to be gossips and busybodies, talking about things they should not. Oh, we were just all gathered together talking. We were just all over here talking. We weren't doing anything wrong. We were just talking. And then Dina is seen by this man who stalks her, who develops a lust for her, and stalked her. Do you see the evil that results in this? Turn over to 1 Corinthians 10. We're going to drive this home, brothers and sisters, because this should never, this should never ever go on again after today. And we should all be watching out for it and reminding one another. You should have all these scriptures now marked on a list in your notes and in your book of Yahweh so that you can point them out to others who try to get you involved in these things. Now, in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 1, Moreover, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact that all our fathers were under the cloud. And these are the ones that came out of Egypt and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moshe in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food at the house of Yahweh. And all drank the same spiritual drink at the house of Yahweh. For they drank of the spiritual rock. Well, let's continue down to five here. But with some of them, Yahweh was not well pleased. And so they were scattered over the wilderness. Verse six. Now these are examples for us, these things that we're about to read here are examples for us to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Because this is a lust for pleasure, a lust for enjoyment. Just like the video games, the movies, and, and all these other things are. It's a lust and you need to admit it to yourself that these things are there. These are a lust for enjoyment and pleasure. But they lusted. So do not become worshipers of God's Elohim as some of them were. As it is written, 
And this is in Exodus 34, 32, 4 and 6. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to worship Yahweh. Oh, wait a minute. That's the wrong verse. They rose up to play. They rose up to seek pleasure, to seek enjoyment, to seek entertainment. Oh, you should have heard the stories they were telling. Right? Admit That's what goes on, right? Come on, we've all been there. <laughs> we all messed up at some point and we need to change. We need to get this eating and drinking and rising up to play out of our life. And this led them to you know, to think of the children of Israel that came out, they, they ended up worshiping Baal Peor, which wasn't a statue, it was a practice that Potiphar's wife must have taught them, <laughs> and they brought that practice with them. And they continued it, and they didn't want to let it go. Even the pattern of it, the pathway to it, following the pattern that leads to it. Nor let us commit sexual sins, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Well, that's just a harmless gathering. It's just our family. Well, we're going to see about that. Nor let us tempt Yahweh, as some of them also tempted him, and were destroyed by serpents. Not that Yahweh can be tempted, but they thought, well, let's see how far we can go with this before we get in trouble. Now, you may think that when the priest comes and talks to you, oh, he got, I got in trouble. No, you were already in trouble with Yahweh, and Yahweh sent the priest to you to get you out of trouble. Of course, after the correction comes verse 10, and do not murmur, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things took place with them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, not for us to follow them. Is that what you look for when you read the scriptures? Well, I only read the parts I shouldn't do, and then I do that. You know, is that what you, your mindset is? No, these were written for our admonition. So we would avoid these situations, avoid the situation that leads in any way that would start you down the path to this result. On whom... The ends of the ages have come. Well, who do you think that might be? Did the end of the age come on Abraham? Who's it on? Us, right here. He's talking to us. And we need to put this to use in our own life. Notice verse 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands... Well, this isn't going to hurt me. I can do this and not... Be affected by it. Be on guard that he does not fall. And I think in the King James there also, it's lest he falls. Because if you do these things and put yourself in harm's way, you will fall. There is no temptation taken hold of you except what is common to mankind. And Yahweh is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. So we're, ha we're without excuse, brothers and sisters, because he says when you are tempted, he will also make the way of escape. Well, just because you didn't take the way of escape, is that his fault? that you may be able to bear it. He gave Yosef the way of escape. 
Now, he may have ended up in jail, and Yosef did, remember? Because the, the queen really didn't fuss about what she accused him of because she was wanting him to do that. Remember? We just read it. She fussed because she didn't get her way. This Egyptian independence that's been bred into every one of us. Because we all came from the 12 tribes, right? And where were the 12 tribes before they settled in the land of Israel? In Egypt. So we all got a little bit of that, that carnality that we need to fight and get rid of. We need to get rid of it. We need to fight it. I want to read, uh, we're going to get into more of pastor's quotes here. But I want to read uh, about the family gatherings. Because they're a real doozy here. 2 Samuel 13. Second Samuel 13, and let's start in verse 1. After this, Absalom, the son of David, had a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, who was another son of David, fell in love with her. Amnon became so frustrated over Tamar that he became sick. Amnon had a friend whose name was Yonadab, son of Shimea, David's brother, and Yonadab was a very crafty man. He'll find a loophole in this law of possession, just you watch. He asked Amnon, Why do you, the king's son, look thinner day after day? Will you tell me? Amnon told him, I'm in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Yonadab said to him, Lie down on your bed and pretend to be ill. When your father comes to see you, say to him, Allow my sister Tamar to come and give me food. A family gathering. Okay, can you see it? It's a family gathering. Let her prepare the food in my sight, so I may watch her, and then eat it from her hand. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. When the king came to see him, Amnon asked the king, Allow my sister Tamar to come and make some cakes in my sight, so I may eat from her hand. Now David Made a mistake here. Sent word to Tamar at home saying, Go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare food for him. Thinking it was all innocent here, okay? How often do situations come up and we think it's all so innocent? Yet we don't know the heart of Amnon. Because no, we can't read minds just yet. Uh, and prepare food. So Tamar went to the house of her brother and he was lying down. She took flour and kneaded it, made the bread in his sight and baked it. Then she took the pan of bread and served him. But he refused, and Amnon commanded, send everyone from me. See, there was others there, all gathered, the family. Well, they're all family, right? Then Amnon said to Tamar, bring the food into the bedroom, so I may eat from your hand. So Tamar took the bread she had made and brought it to Amnon, her brother, in the bedroom. 
<clears throat> and then he tries to entice her to sin. And then ends up forcing himself, stalking. This is stalking. So you think you're at a gathering. The women there with their husbands, and the husband is looking at another, the other woman who's not his wife, and starts to lust. Well, can I come over and get some food later? Oh, sure, just come on in. Come on in and get some food. Yeah, she'll make it up for you real quick. Do you see how this can occur? Are we going to open the door to that in our own life? Read the rest of that later and see the heartache and the evil that resulted from it. And the death that took place because of not guarding, of letting our guard down, of not protecting the families. You know, consider this at a family gathering too. Yahweh says a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife. This is even in the vow. So I know everyone married, they've agreed. They vowed to Yahweh that they would leave their father and mother and cling to their wife in their own home. A father gives his daughter to the man. Now, unless we're so deficient on the law of ownership, think what has taken place there. You gave, and, and we fathers, you know, pastor taught me years ago, we raise our daughter for another man. And then we're out of the picture. The counselors may stay in the picture, but we've given. There's that ownership. And then we want to call them all back and all hang out together and have a Tamar situation. Not picking on Tamar. She didn't do anything wrong. Have an Amnon situation come up. Or a Potiphar's wife situation. There's evil on both sides, not picking on men or women. Here, I'm not picking on anybody. I'm picking on the ideas and thoughts and impulses that we need to get rid of. Because I know pastors cried tears not wanting to hear any that Yahweh has brought to him and Yahshua have to say to any of us, Get away from me, I never knew you. Remember, Abraham was called away from his father's house. Even when he sent his servant, he said, just don't take my son back there. Okay, so did he have to go check out the woman? And we may want to reemphasize on these uh, steps to the, the 12 steps to the progression of intimacy. Eye to body, eye to eye. And then at the same time, voice to voice. And then it goes on from there to the 12 steps of disaster. Think of Isaac. He never, <laughs> till the marriage was set, he never was eye to eye, never eye to body, never eye to eye, never even voice to voice until that was arranged and set up because of the examination of character. And I'm getting off there, but, you know, like the apostle said, er, you know, beside that, he said, we need to live as though we had none. We need to set our minds on this kingdom. But a man gives his daughter away. She doesn't belong to the dad anymore. The dad is no longer her guide, her head her advisor. But this is the plan of Yahweh. You think, well, I don't want my daughter to go through that. Well, your mom went through that. If you're talking about going through that, 
Well, she still needs me. Well, your mom seemed to do just fine and got you here running, you know. <laughs> All right. And when we have these types of gatherings, what do we do? Bring Sarah right out of the tent? <laughs> come on, Sarah. No, no. Oh, come on. Now, maybe you'll say, well, none of these things occurred at my house. With my family, we didn't have anything go on like this, but you did. You participated in that, yeah, not that you know of, but you participated in that Egyptian lifestyle. You brought the practices of Egypt here with you. You know, when we follow in the same footsteps, turn over to Ephesians 4. Because there is a remedy for this, and I don't mean we got to get this in our minds, though, how deeply harmful and dangerous this visitation is. In, uh, in Ephesians 4, we're commanded. to give this gives place to the devil. Give her no room or opportunity. Give no room to the devil. Don't open the door a little bit. She's a snake, remember? She'll slither right in. (laughs) If you still believe in snakes. And do not grieve spirit holy by which you were sealed for the day of redemption. Okay? When we... When we do this, we step off the established path that Yahweh has set for us. And we're commanded, step only on established paths. Who established them for us in these last days? Pastor did. He established our path. When we go even a little bit to the right or left, are we heading toward Yahweh again? No, we're going toward the devil. Just a little bit. How much bacon do you have to eat to be considered eating pork? (laughs) Well, I didn't even have a mouthful. (laughs) Brethren, our minds should be fully on making it into this great kingdom that's coming because nuclear war is soon to destroy the earth and everything in it. So what should we be doing instead of this visitation? Well, Yahshua told us in Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. And how do we do that? Deuteronomy 12, 5. Come to the house of Yahweh. You want to visit? Well, we got all day today. We got the new moon tomorrow night. We got a feast coming up here pretty soon. This is where we visit and fellowship with one another. This is where we catch up. You want to have a meal? Come to the cafeteria. Tables and chairs and everything all there for you to sit down and have a meal. Don't tell me you have no place to go and have a meal with your brothers. Men or your sisters, women. This is Yahweh's way. Yahweh has provided a way for ourselves to be not just given pleasure, although it is very pleasant, how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell in unity. But to do it without breaking any laws of Yahweh, without violating ownership, without violating someone's private space. And there's harm that comes even if the person invites you in. They're harming themselves even though they may not realize it at the moment. And lust begins. One man enters another man's house, say it's a single guy. Oh, you got one of those? Oh man, I want one of those. So immediately he starts lusting after something that Yahweh hasn't blessed him with. Now how do you deal with the lust? Do you become like Amnon, 
so frustrated that you can't get what you want? That you'll scheme and plot to forcefully get it? This is what it leads to. If we think we're stronger than the devil, the only strength we have against the devil is what? Yahweh's laws. Keeping Yahweh's laws. We step out of that and we're open the door to be rended like a rag and shredded by who knows how. There's a million ways that can occur. And then Yahshua told us to humble ourselves. Humble ourselves as little children under the hand of the great priest that he set over his house. Humble ourselves. And we find that in Deuteronomy 17. Let's look there real quick. And I want to read you this. I tell you, it's a whole book, books of Israel filled with this information about this. If you'll go to Israel Says... And just uh, read, I started uh, looking up, I looked up the word parties and party. And you'll have to weed through because there's talking about other political items as well. But just there's page after page, 10 printed out pages of it. And, and I know I didn't get all of it either. Humble yourself as a little child. How do you do that? Oh, well, I feel humble in my heart. Really? Well, go to the priest and to the judge who is in office at that time. Ask for their decision. Don't make your own decision. Should I go there? Should I do this? Should I do that? Well, I'm smart enough to know better. Really? And they will give you the sentence of judgment. You must act according to the sentence they pronounce for you. There goes your independence right there. Be careful to do all they order you to do. According to the law they teach you. And if you have any problem, we can always, it can always uh, be appealed to the priest. If you think that much that it's being told wrong. But the, first what you must do is not turn aside to the right hand or left hand from the sentence. Because the priest is going to receive counsel also. The other priests and the Kohanas will receive counsel on these decisions. But that's between them and the priest, okay? Okay. Between us and our counselors, the one, now this isn't just men here, the one who acts presumptuously and who shows contempt for the priest who stands to minister in front of Yahweh, your father, or the judge, that man must be put to death. That person will hear the words, get away from me, I never knew you, you worker of iniquity. In this way you will purge the evil from Israel. Because Yahweh's not allowing this stuff in his kingdom. He's giving us a choice and an opportunity right now to get rid of it. So let's stay out of one another's private dwellings. A rule of thumb here. If you don't live there, you don't go inside. Now, you may have a work order in your hand, but you, the workers don't go there until they're given notice, everybody's out. It's safe to go in. They don't go in there partying, drinking, and eating, raiding the refrigerator. Uh, what was we supposed to fix again? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> what was that stuff we just ate? <laughs> you know? <laughs> There's no real reason to go to go there. Now there's excuses galore. All right? For I think for every one of the 613 laws, there's 613,000 excuses why you can't do it. 
All right? But there's no reasons. All right? We're commanded to redeem the time. I want to read you just a couple more of these here. The pastor said this is also from the sixth book of Israel, chapter 9 and verse 78. I remember people coming to my house and dad would never let them in. I don't remember one of them ever coming inside the house. Dad would talk to them outside. Mother would take care of the woman in a different place. The total change came forth in the last 50 years due to television in Hollywood. The parties. And we know what a party is now, right? And going from house to house increased. Even the apostles had trouble with the people going from house to house, and they scolded the people for it. Brethren, you need to be redeeming your time, as Yahshua said. Even the studies. I remember we had men that would say, oh, we're getting together to study. I found out what that meant. It was called boxing without the gloves. Because arguments, fights would break out. Everybody without the priest there would lean on their own understanding and there would be no study. Brethren, this is where you come to study. This is where you come to, to the services, to your appointments with Yahweh, to the classes we have all day, and the workshops and so forth where you can bring your questions to the priest. And there's no argument because we ask it able and that settles the matter. Now, when you're home in your private dwelling, as the definition said, that's the time for you to read. Read or listen to the sermons by yourself, between you and Yahweh. And then come to the house for speech class, and you can speak to your heart's content. You may have to wait a week or two. You may get the buzzer like I used to. (laughs) But you can speak there. All right? That's where you do it. Redeeming the time. Making up for lost time. There was a couple others here. Uh, It says, here is some more here. This is the fifth book of Israel, chapter 21 and verse 19. Here is some more here. Koan Yedidia will probably read these in their full extent the next time we speak. It says, do kids understand uh, let's uh, racy jokes on television? Well, that's another thing that would occur. People get together and they turn on the television. I brought out in sermons many times that this is what occurs with visitations and parties. I brought out many times that the parties were starting with Hollywood. They have gradually taken morals down. They started the dating games and things like this. And the jokes always led the mind back to what they wanted them to do. Think Amnon here. Uh, Now the uh, first book of Israel, chapter 15 and verse 33. Now the women are doing it too. They are advertising and pushing this thing forward. The women have started their bachelorette parties, had told how they were mimicking these sins. And that's exactly what the scriptures say. They and men do this too. Now they were only following the men who had their, quote, bachelor parties. They are making themselves like this. They are becoming their image, their likeness. All right, and this is all from Hollywood that was trained in Egypt. Well, we don't have much time to redeem the time that's already been wasted. So let's turn over, and for our closing scripture, we'll go to 2 Kepha 3, and we'll start in verse 11. Well, let's look at verse 10, because this is what's coming. And yes, it's going to come and catch some who aren't paying attention, who aren't truly studying, who are 
maybe leaning on their own understanding, puffing themselves up with their own uh, great intellectual idiocy and so forth, and not humbling themselves. But the day of Yahweh, first, uh, the second key for 310, will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works, the works, the practices, the practices and the people who practice them will be burned up. Since all these things will then be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to be in holy, holy conduct in righteousness? Holy gatherings. Yes, Yahweh hasn't taken gathering away. He's taken away the sin out of the gatherings and given us an opportunity to enjoy time with one another. And very soon we're going to enjoy all time. And like Pastor said, there'll be plenty of time for visiting and catching up and all that stuff in the kingdom. But for now... Beloved, since you are looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace in complete unity with Yahweh. Praise Yahweh. That's all the time we have. May Yahweh bless your understanding. And we'll now turn the services over to the great Gahan Michael. Please be seated for a moment there. Earlier we talked about the, uh, the website. And that's, everybody knows how to get to it. Simply type in www.yahweh.com, okay? In case you don't know how to get there. And make sure you get there and uh, make a review for us, okay? For everybody, I should say. This is for the world. This is what we're out there for, is to bring forth. Wasn't that a great sermon? Yeah. Praise y'all. Yeah. Excellent. Well, brethren, you know, the, the House of Yahweh has certain people in charge of um, certain things in the work. And uh, sometimes certain people are sent out for the work to inquire about information. Okay? And when they do... This is someone being sent out, okay? You understand that? That's what it means to be sent, when you're sent with authority to go out and to do something, okay? And remember, you know, being in unity with love and respect for one another to all the members in the house of Yahweh and the ones sent, it's what we're being taught, coming to unity. But, you know, if you speak to someone who comes to you and ask questions for the work, and you speak to them with sarcasm, you're showing that to Yahweh. Sarcasm is shown to the one who was sent to you, it's shown to pastor, it's shown to Yeshua, and it's shown to the creator who created you, who made that person the same as you are. The one that you're supposed to show love and respect to, right? Sarcasm. Let me read you this because this is important. Sarcasm is the use of words that mean the opposite of what you really want to say. Now, why would you say the opposite of what you want to say? That's opposition. That's retaliation. That's deception. Saying the opposite. It's saying the opposite of what you really want to say, especially in order to insult someone, to show irritation, or to be funny. Or we should say, not to be funny, but to be foolish at your own expense, right? But to be, you know, to show irritation. You get irritated at someone and you talk to them sarcastically. You know, it reminds you of the parable of what Yeshua talked about. Remember when he talked about the kingdom of heaven is like the man who owned a vineyard and he sent out his servants? And they ended up mistreating the servants. They ended up beating the servants. You know, you can beat somebody with your own words. You can beat them down. 
Finally, he sent his son, right? Thinking, oh, are they going to respect him? Surely they show him love and respect and concern, care, all the things that they're supposed to, right? And what did they end up doing? They end up killing him. Well, you can kill someone with your words. You can kill someone with your actions. You see, what Yeshua was pointing out was an attitude. An attitude that we're not supposed to have. Okay? We're supposed to have a loving attitude. When someone comes to us and they're a sent, they certainly wouldn't stick their nose where it don't belong. And that's what people think, you know. People think, well, what's that person asking this for? Well, if you have a question, you can always answer them what needs to be done. And then, uh, you know, if you're that dang curious, you might have to find out, ask someone in authority, okay? But don't, don't act sarcastic. You're doing that to Yahweh when you do that. And we have control over our attitudes, don't we? We've learned all of these things. Just like I said today, you know, don't tempt Yahweh. Well, we're tempting Yahweh when we do this kind of stuff. So, you know, when people come to us and, you know, they're, they're, they're coming for a reason. So when an errand is run for pastor or someone who's in authority and needs certain information, don't act sarcastic because you're showing Yahweh. Okay, because you are Yahweh to me and I am Yahweh to you. Right? So if I act that way towards you, I better break down. I better break down right then and there. Because I'm doing it to Yahweh. Okay? Keep these things in mind, brethren. This is what unity is all about. This is what the love of Yahweh is about. When the world sees us, they should see Yahweh. If they don't, we need to examine ourselves. And repent bitterly, because time is short. Okay? May Yahweh bless you. If everyone please stand, we'll turn it over to...